Okay, guys, this is uh, slide 10 and our last slide in our World War I unit, uh, the Treaty of Versailles fight. Um, while the, the peace conference was in Paris, the actual peace treaty signing took place in Versailles. Uh, it's a suburb of Paris outside the city, big, uh, big palace there, one of the Louis, I forget which one. Um, but uh, notice it's the Treaty of Versailles. Now, we have a city here in Kentucky outside of Lexington spelled the same way uh, called Versailles. That's because we're from Kentucky and say Versailles. Uh, but when we're talking about the one in France, let's call it by its French name, Versailles. Uh, the Treaty of Versailles. Okay. Now, as we said uh, in our last slide, Wilson makes a huge mistake by not taking any Republicans with him. Uh, and he's going to have to come home and convince a Republican Congress uh, to approve the Democratic president negotiated treaty. Um, that is going to be a, a, a very difficult uh, task. Okay? Leading the fight against this are the uh, Senate Republicans who have a, are known as the irreconcilable. To reconcile yourself to something is to be in agreement with it. Well, they are irreconcilable. They will not be in agreement with um, President Wilson nor his treaty uh, that ends the war. Okay? Um, they vow to fight this to the very end. Uh, in fact, the Irreconcilables is one of their nicknames. They have an even cooler nickname. Um, they, they call themselves the Battalion of Death. Hey, that's a cool nickname. Uh, they vow to fight this treaty to, to the death. Okay, um, And again, they are led by um, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, the leader of the Irreconcilables, the Battalion of Death, uh, Lodge has vowed to fight this treaty uh, until it is defeated or he is defeated, one of the two. Okay. Um, now, Wilson cannot convince Congress to support it, so instead he figures, if I can't convince these congressmen to support this treaty, maybe I can convince the general public that it, the treaty is a good idea, and then when the senators won't approve it, they'll vote the senators out of office, so I can get them out of the job. So Wilson decides he's going to go on tour to drum up some support for the Treaty of Versailles. Well, um, Wilson's coming up on the end of his terms here in office here. Um, he is in poor health to begin with. He's exhausted uh, and tired when he heads out on a cross-country uh, train tour to speak um, about um, the treaty and to drum up some support for it. Okay. While he is in um, Colorado, September of 1919, while he is in Colorado, um, Wilson collapsed from physical uh, and nervous exhaustion. He, just, he had a breakdown. He, he was done. Um, he was taken back to Washington, D.C. as quickly as they could, where several days later, Wilson suffered a stroke that paralyzed one side of his body. Okay. Um, for more than seven months, he did not meet with his cabinet. Um, he met with only one or two advisors, his closest advisors. But the cabinet didn't see him for seven months. The public didn't see him for seven months. The only person they saw was his wife, Edith Wilson, um, who was his spokesperson. Um, she would deliver messages from the president to the press, to the cabinet, to Congress. Um, she was the go-between. No one else was allowed to see the president. Um, so nobody knew exactly what condition he was in. Um, it was widely debated who was really running the country, Woodrow or Edith Wilson, one of the two. Okay. Um, now, while the president is laid up, Lodge goes on the offensive and really starts attacking um, the treaty. 
His big problem with the treaty is Article 10. That's not Article X. It's Roman numeral 10, okay? Article 10 of the Treaty of Versailles. And Article 10 basically says that uh, the, it's, it deals with the League of Nations, okay? Wilson's dream here. Uh, and Article 10 basically says that if one League country is attacked, all other League countries have to come to its defense. Now, if you think about it, everybody that's joining the League of Nations, because they're safety in numbers, right, is in Europe. Nobody in Europe has an army left, okay? Um, so who's the only real super power left in the world at this point? We are, the United States. What Article 10 is going to commit us to doing is defending every other country that joins the League of Nations. So if any country is attacked, the United States has to put an army together, go there, and defend that country. And what do we get out of this? Well, if we are attacked, Belgium is going to rush to our defense. Hooray! Yeah. Um, we get nothing out of this. We're going to have to defend half of the world and get nothing for it. Lodge says, I'm not agreeing to that. I will not do that to this country. Okay? Um, so that sets the stage now for the presidential, presidential sorry, election in 1920. Okay? Now, remember, the war ended. A uh, peace treaty was signed in 1919. Um, we have an election coming up in 1920. And the big campaign topic is going to be the Treaty of Versailles and specifically the League of Nations, whether we should join or not. All right, here's our, uh, our candidates, our uh, players here. The Republicans are going to nominate um, Ohio Senator Warren G. Harding. And this is uh, Harding, picture on the left here. Um, Harding, it says on the, uh, the slide here, uh, Republican fence sitter. Now, if you are a fence sitter, it means that you're kind of stuck in the middle of an issue. Nobody's quite sure which side you're on. Nobody was really sure whether Harding was for or against the treaty. It really depended on where he was standing in the country at the time. Okay. Um, if he was in the Midwest, he was against the treaty, because the Midwest typically supported Republicans. So if he was campaigning in the Midwest, he badmouthed the treaty. If he headed out west to democratically controlled states, he was in favor of the treaty. And you got to remember, you know, communication back then is not what it is now. You had newspapers that came out ever so often. Um, and West Coast newspapers didn't get read on the East Coast, and vice versa. So you could do, you could pull this off a lot easier back then than you could now with mass media, right? So Harding, whether he was for or against the treaty, depended greatly on where he was standing when you asked him. Okay, so he kind of sat on the fence. He ran a front porch campaign, right? Um, he was seen as just the good outgoing, friendly, personable guy, right? Um, people were tired of Wilson's high and mighty Ivy League, um, Princeton president, idealistic morals. Harding seemed the common, average, everyday guy. You know, shake a hand, pat you on the back, and call you his friend. Um, he ran this front porch campaign, where literally he just sat on his front porch and people came and talked to him. He campaigned on a what was called a return to normalcy. Now, normalcy is simply just that. Return to normal. The way things were before the war. Remember, when the war broke out, the United States was an isolationist country. We just wanted to keep, our, to, keep to ourselves, right? Right. Harding says, we need to get back to that. 
We shouldn't have been dragged into this European mess to begin with, and we're certainly not going to go into another one. So let's get things back to the way they were before this whole mess started. Right? Democrats are going to run a treaty supporter, as you can imagine, um, James Cox. Remember, Wilson was a Democrat. Um, so they're running Ohio Governor James Cox. It's one of those rare cases where both the two main party candidates are from the same state, both Ohio. Um, Cox will go around saying, we need to ratify this treaty. We need to get the League of Nations up and running. We need to take a lead. Okay? We have a third candidate here, a socialist jailbird, Eugene Debs. Remember, anything socialism, it's Debs, right? Well, Debs runs a campaign and runs for president from prison. Notice the, uh, the political cartoon down here. Debs was serving a 10-year prison term for violating the Espionage and Sedition Acts, speaking out against the war, interfering with the draft. Right? So the political cartoon here, got the little sign, yours for the presidency, UVG Debs, or Eugene V. Debs. Uh, and he's saying, well, anyhow, there are worse places than a front porch, looking at the front porch of the White House here from jail, right? Um, so Debs will actually get uh, almost a million votes while in prison. And everybody asks, if, if he had won, would he have been able to... Pre no, no, he would not, okay? He, he would not have been able to serve, okay? So... Um, in fact, we've fixed that in the Constitution now. Can't run for president from jail. Anyway, um, our winner here will be Warren G. Harding. Okay? Um, he'll, he will win, in terms of a popular vote, uh, the largest margin of victory to date, up to that point. And once we've got a Republican Congress and a Republican president, the treaty will fail. Senate never does ratify the Treaty of Versailles. In fact, we have to find our, uh, sign our own separate peace treaty with Germany uh, because we don't sign on to the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and what that ultimately is going to mean for Wilson is that his dream of a League of Nations will be realized. The League of Nations will be built um, it will be headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, the historically neutral Switzerland, um, and the United States never joins. Wilson's dream is realized. A League of Nations is created, but he will die without seeing the United States join it. So that the, the ultimate cruel twist of irony here, right? Um, and when the United States refuses to join the League of Nations... The treaty isn't the only thing that fails. The League of Nations will fail. Um, if you have a set of laws set up, but you cannot enforce them, they do you absolutely no good. Okay? So when the League of Nations is established and countries start doing things to violate the laws and the rules of the League of Nations, no one is strong enough to stop them from doing it. So we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but fast forward to 1937, 38, 39, pre-World War II. When Germany starts rebuilding its military, which they will, and the League of Nations says, no, you can't do that, stop. But nobody makes them stop. Germany just rebuilds its military. And when Germany starts invading other countries and the League of Nations says, stop, you can't do that, but nobody makes them stop, they keep doing it. When the United States refuses to join the League of Nations, it is doomed. When the strongest peacekeeping force in the world doesn't join the peacekeeping organization, there will be no one to keep the peace. The League of Nations is doomed to fail because the United States refuses to join. Okay? And that sets us up for World War II. But that's still two units away, okay? Okay. This wraps up our World War I unit. We have one more unit to get through here this semester uh, on the Roaring Twenties. I'll see you then.